Politico, 19th of March 2024, Europe's failing China policy requires a conclusion. Chinese deceit has successfully fooled Europe for a very long time, but it has burned Europe numerous times. Most European countries have changed their stances on China over the past 10 years, going from naive optimism about Beijing's economic appeal to widespread anxiety about its various threats. This significant change has been brought about by rising awareness of China's reality, President Xi Jinping's assertiveness, pressure from the United States, and the coincidence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine with a strengthening alliance between China and Russia. Concurrently, European officials and leaders have intensified their endeavors to present a unified front against China in fora like the G7, working with Washington and other U.S. allies. We applaud the shift to a more cautious approach. But in recent years, officials have made several swift U-turns on issues ranging from Chinese investment to Chinese students, making policymaking reactive and dispersed. Furthermore, considering the scope of the worldwide threat posed by Xi and the Chinese Communist Party, European nations must move far beyond just playing whack-a-mole and reacting to Beijing's threats individually. Instead, a more thorough examination of the ultimate goals of Europe's China policy is desperately needed, as well as how much of these goals are shared with the United States, other allies, and other countries on the continent. For example, the United States is more motivated by its competitiveness with China. However, European countries no longer saw China as an existential danger to their dominance in the world because they hadn't been superpowers for a long time. Furthermore, people should concentrate on the November U.S. presidential election. If former President Donald Trump is elected, European states will probably need to adopt a more autonomous foreign policy to former President Donald Trump is elected, European states will probably need to adopt a more autonomous foreign policy to protect themselves against the unpredictable and highly transactional nature of Trump's foreign policy. Furthermore, if President Joe Biden is re-elected, his administration will probably put more pressure on Europe to tighten its China policy and align it with the White House's agenda. To facilitate discussions regarding the convergence and divergence of transatlantic China policy, I collaborated with colleagues at Chatham House and the Royal United Services Institute to arrange seminars for policymakers in the United States and Europe. Our findings are summarized here. In these talks, security goals were generally agreed upon, with Europeans and Americans desiring to keep things as they were in Asia. This entails preserving Taiwan's de facto independence, keeping the South China Sea open to all, and strengthening deterrence against potential Chinese attacks in the future. However, there were notable disparities in focus, with American officials often being more concerned about Beijing's danger to Taiwan. Furthermore, even though European and American officials have decided to discuss de-risking from China rather than decoupling economically, Washington is more concerned with maintaining American technical dominance than Europe is with cutting ties. One person who attended our class in London commented, de-risking is a question of degree and time. The United States seeks a swift de-risking. While many others in the EU support de-risking, they are hesitant to proceed as swiftly or broadly. During our discussions, it also became evident that de-risking is closely linked to implementing domestic industrial strategy, placing transatlantic partners in direct rivalry with China. Finally, regarding the multilateral system, we discovered that European officials were concerned about U.S. unilateralism, even as they shared a desire to counter China's more successful diplomacy in international organizations and the Global South. Furthermore, the increased likelihood of Trump winning the presidency again just exacerbates these anxieties. However, several U.S. officials issued a warning, claiming that their European counterparts were misjudging China's danger and that multilateral cooperation could not survive in a world that is becoming increasingly divided. At our session in Washington, one participant declared, global multilateral institutions will be places of contestation between the U.S. and its allies and partners against China and other liberal powers. Therefore, in addition to seeking rhetorical unity in their increasingly specific public pronouncements regarding China, policymakers in the United States and Europe must also be honest about their disagreements to ensure that their cooperation is practical rather than purely token. Furthermore, given the recent temporary improvement in ties between China and the West, now is a good time for Europeans to consider the long-term objectives of their China policy more carefully and determine the best way to achieve them. More money will be spent enhancing European understanding of Chinese politics, business, and society to achieve this. Few experts in China policy exist in Europe, making it challenging to encourage thoughtful discussion. In addition, 
Europe must pose serious queries regarding the intended endgame of its China policy. What type of global position is Europe willing to tolerate for China? Which economic sectors in Europe are actually at risk from Chinese pressure? How much will it cost to reduce these vulnerabilities, and who will foot the bill? Furthermore, to what extent can China's aspirations be resisted by Europe's meager global military might, both within and outside of Asia? One senior diplomat from a non-European ally of the United States told me that disclosing these differences amongst U.S. partners amounts to Beijing doing the legwork for it when I presented our preliminary findings with them. On the other hand, transatlantic partners cannot effectively collaborate with China unless they improve their knowledge of their areas of difference and shared goals. Dealing with China is likely a multi-decade, if not multi-generational, problem.